Well, it is a great honor to be here at the Friends Center, uh, to be with Johan Galtung. You know, just a few days ago, we interviewed him on Democracy Now! Um, and there we were looking uh, through the TV screen into a TV studio in Minneapolis where there was Johan Galtung at the other end. He was in Minneapolis for yet another course he was giving. Um, and I don't often get uh, the experience a few days later to be able to jump out of the TV screen and then we meet in person, but it was just thrilling uh, to be able to do this at the last minute, to be here in person with Johan. Um, we had Johan Galtung on because it was the beginning of the trial of Anders Bering Breivik, uh, the um, anti-Muslim Norwegian militant who is on trial right now for that horrific massacre that took place last July. Um, how many, uh, first in a bombing, he killed eight people, then he went off to an island a uh, summer camp, a labor youth camp, uh, where he killed, gunned down 77 people, mainly young people. One of those who survived was a uh, young woman, 20 years old, Johann Galtung's granddaughter. Um, and right after this happened last July, we reached Johann somewhere in the world and talked to you on the phone. And I was wondering if you could start off by talking about your granddaughter's experience and then you making some sense of this or sharing commentary on who this man is, uh, what has happened in Norway, and how your country is dealing with this. But start with your granddaughter. Thank you, Amy. And let me also thank Michael and AFSC for this wonderful occasion. Now, my granddaughter, Ida, I love her. She had been on vacation in the US and was back from vacation. Had landed at the Oslo airport and went to this island, Utøya, where it is a kind of sacred place for the Labour Party youth movement. And in the years, let us say, 47 to about 1950, it had a young boy as a member with the name Johan Galtung. So it's in the family. And this is the place, you see, where left-wing social democracy is meeting each other, is blossoming. And um, I must say, Anders Breivik, from his screwed up point of view of history and everything, was some talent behind choosing that place. There was a little ferry, a five minutes ferry, and my granddaughter was standing next to him. On the ferry? He, on the ferry. He had a strange uniform and a big suitcase. And she didn't recognize the uniform as a police uniform, but it was very difficult to sort of reject it. You know, the uniform exudes authority. And uh, when he then started, it's a long story, we cut it short. She and her girlfriend, escaped very quickly and were hiding behind a boulder, a big stone. And they understood very quickly that here it's a question of hiding, not running. And for heaven's sake, don't run into the ice cold water. It's where he shot them. So he was standing on the other side of the boulder, killing her friends, including a very close boyfriend. So <laughs> this is much, this is heavy. But of course, what came to my mind, as you know, Amy, I have been saying all the time, is that Norwegian soldiers are doing the same in Afghanistan and killing considerably more than 77. And their philosophy, their story, what they are doing is about as crazy as Breivik's, their view of history. And instead of trying to solve the problem, they resort to violence. So, if I want to summarize my own, <laughs> my own creed in one sentence, you don't like violence? Identify the underlying conflict and solve it, please. Neither the Norwegian government nor Anders Breivik are doing that. As you pointed out, Amy, my beloved granddaughter, she came away unscathed. She's a strong young woman. 
strong young woman. I feel that she is going to dedicate much of her life to this kind of problem. However you define the problem. Uh, she's studying law and she's come out of it unscarred psychologically. She had a problem, her girlfriend was not quite that strong. So you're lying there under a green rain protection sheet, you see, and you are trying to prevent your girlfriend from shouting and crying. She was almost choking her. Terrible situation. But this is the more private galtung angle to it. For Anders Bering Brevik, tell us about what strain he represents, who I he is. I see nothing particular Norwegian, and I don't say that because I want to get rid of him, <laughs> being a Norwegian myself. Uh, there's nothing particular Norwegian in it. There's nothing right-wing party in it. He was a member of a right-wing party, but he's not that right-wing. It's uh, anti-immigration, but that's a legal position to have. Um, I see him as living in the past. You see, the questions he gets in court are too much geared to the present. He lives at the time of the Crusades. He made his terrible deed, his misdeed, on the 22nd of July. 22nd of July, 1099. The Crusaders conquered Jerusalem. The Knights Templar, he associates with that one. But that doesn't mean that he has a group today called Knights Templar, you see. If I should use the word, the Norwegian police is suffering from presentism. Too much focusing on the present. He is the kind of guy a professor would like to have as a student knowledgeable, autodidact, imaginative, and this has taken command of him. The 22nd of July, 1946, the Irgun gang of Jewish terrorists, some later became prime ministers, exploded Hotel King David in Jerusalem. Now here you have three 22nd of July, by chance, not quite. So he's living an axis of history and somehow acting it out. Uh, there is a Judeo-Christian element, there is a Freemason element. He was expelled by the Freemasons the same afternoon. Now, as the P2 Pedua in Italy will tell you, the Freemasons could be quite heavily infiltrated by secret services. Although who infiltrates whom can be discussed. Could be mutual, you know, could be reciprocal. So um, the Freemasons have been left aside. Now, I'm not accusing anybody, but there's one point about Freemasons. Illuminati, circles of that type. Secrecy and oath, mutual oaths. So there are parts of networks that are sworn to death to protect each other. So I'm indicating, Amy, that if you want, if one wants to look for something, look at the past. He's, he's knowledgeable of history, more than the people who are accusing him, more than the attorneys and the police. Um, it's very easy to find mistakes, but that's not the point. That's a kind of professorial activity. And point two, look at what is under the surface of hidden oaths. Remaining in the past for one moment, one more moment, if you could talk about uh, your own history and your father in Norway, in Oslo, where you come from, your father and mother. From a little town called Moss, M-O-S-S, -S. I tried to put it on the map now. And my father was born there. He was a physician. His father was a physician. His father was a physician. So when I was born, my uncle sent a cable to my father, a physician has been born. <laughs> now, that is a so-called prognosis, and you know, in social science, we have something called the self-denying prophecy, you know. But if I shall look at what I learned as a little child, 
Because, see, I think psychologists have missed out some point. They have missed out on the importance of the dinner table conversation. Diane is coming here with two lovely twins. Think of what they are going to listen to when they grow up. What was I listening to? My mother was a nurse, the daughter of the director of health of Norway. Diagnosis, prognosis, therapy, diagnosis, prognosis, therapy, diagnosis, prognosis, therapy. You read my book, you'll find it all over the place. All over the place. So I tried to find out what Karl Marx was listening to and Sigmund Freud was listening to. I'll not bother you with that, but um, the formative power of your parents, enormous. Moss sends its greetings to this meeting. They are starting a peace museum envisioning peace. They are tying it around the second centenary of the ceasefire with Sweden in August 1814. Uh, well, a less polite word would be the Norwegian capitulation. Let us say that that's perhaps a little bit more honest. The, um, what they want is to engage the children actively in envisioning peace and be on Skype with the whole world. And they would like to start with children in Philadelphia. So they start with a tough point, you know. They go, and after that, they take North Korea, South Korea, and things like that. <laughs> so, uh. Your father was uh, imprisoned. He was a kind of mayor of Oslo. He was mayor of Oslo. When? And he was, he was mayor of Oslo in the 1920s. An extremely lovely person, a conservative politician a lieutenant in the Norwegian army, and a Christian. He got a son who was a conscientious objector, left-wing social democrat, <laughs> and a pagan with Buddhist spots. <laughs> That's how I introduced myself religiously. Like a Dalmatian dog, you see, to sort of hopping happily around. And um, we just adored each other. And I had fantastic dialogues. And he presented conservatism with a heart. And all the things that I wanted to know. And if I have become sort of yin-yang oriented, the thing that Diana was hinting at, not too dark, light, white, black, but seeing the white and the black and the black and the white, it's to a large extent due to the dialogues with my beloved father. And the effect of the Nazis on your family? Pardon me? You're the effect of the Nazis. Yes, he as a physician. He <clears throat> was the one who received prisoners who had been tortured to put them together. So he was otorhinolaryngologist and sometimes they attacked centers up there. And he organized the way with which they could meet people from the resistance movement so that they could tell what they had revealed on the torture. On the corridor outside the operation room, they were German soldiers. And you know, Amy, that thing works month one, month two, month three, till the moment come when one German soldier is bright enough to open the door. So my father was arrested that night. The, um, he stayed 14 months and, um, in concentration camp, just outside Oslo. He was what we were most afraid of, was that he would be sent to Germany. The thing number two was that he was, as a prominent Norwegian, used as a hostage for English bombing. And one of his colleagues, also a um, chief physician, at the municipal hospital, or shot in reprisal for English bombing. The English came very often and bombed, uh, with about the same talent in bombing as they have in Afghanistan. It's just unbelievable, and uh, one would believe that now they have made smarter bombs. Uh, they killed a lot of civilians, and the Nazis triumphed each time, and we were scared to death. And Amy, my task was, this is only my mother and me, my two sisters were in Sweden as refugees for illegal work, clandestine work. My task was to pick up the newspaper every morning with the possibility of a headline, Dr. Galtung executed last night in reprisal for the bombing. How does one do that? 
becomes a routine. You pick up the paper, and that headline never came. And he was released the day Roosevelt died, 18th of April, 1945. So he was the bright point, Roosevelt was the dark point. That day, which of course is unforgettable. He happened to, the to be the physician or the commander of the concentration camp. And I'll just finish with that. He asked him, what are you going to do now? You seem to be losing the war, my father said. And he said, after the war, we will make ourselves systematically loved, systematically believed. Now, it's the word systematic I would underline in that sentence, very German. But they have been quite good at it, to put it that way. Uh, we have reconciled. And Germany is the only major perpetrator country that has fully engaged in reconciliation. By admitting completely we did it, presenting the details, and presenting its conversion. By embracing rule of law, democracy, human rights. That was not easy, and their enemies came half of the way, and I'll stop with that, by the two brilliant French politicians who said, Germany has been so atrocious that it has to become a member of the family. And that family was the European community. So I've been looking for two other presidents who would say Israel has been so atrocious that it has to become a member of the family a Middle East community. <laughs> so, Johann Galtung, you have traveled the world preaching peace. What is positive peace? Positive peace has, I think, two basic components. One is equity, or to spell it out, Cooperation for mutual and equal benefit. Please underline the two words, and equal. You see, the West has nothing against cooperation for mutual benefit. It's called capitalism. But it's not exactly equal. And the tragedy of the West is it always wants an edge extra. That little 120% extra, you know. Or 2,400, or what it is. And the second component is harmony, it's attitudinal, it's inside you. And it means that you suffer the suffering of others. You suffer when millions die of hunger and people kill each other. And you enjoy the joy of others. So if we go by equity and harmony, it's not a bad formula for a good marriage. Not a bad formula. But then comes the negative part. There are two things threatening all of this. Trauma and conflict, unresolved conflict. The trauma, that's the violence of the past. And the way to handle that one is reconciliation. The book that Diane mentioned. And I myself have participated in 10 such. One was between the Danish government and Muslim clerics over the Muhammad caricatures. Explain that, the debate between the Muslim clerics and the Danish government over these cartoons. It was Tariq Ramadan and I, we were invited. It happened in Geneva. Tariq Ramadan is the well-known um, uh, Islamic scholar who was invited to be a professor at Notre Dame in the United States, and the U.S. refused him a visa. He's one of the most respected Islamic scholars in the world, so I think he ended up, what, at Oxford? Ended up in Ox at Oxford, I think. I like him very much. He's a very, very fine Islamic scholar. He had lunch with the Danes, and I had lunch with the Muslims. So we were crossing like that. <laughs> The um, <clears throat> Danes told Tariq that, okay, 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 I understand there was a reaction to the caricatures, but to burn Danish embassies and burn Danish flags and to boycott our butter, that is going too far. Can you explain what the cartoons were and where they appeared? 
the Prophet with the bomb in his turban. You see, the guy who did it and the guy who published it had been a journalist in the Soviet Union. And he had been so upset by Soviet journalists who were afraid of getting into problems if they published things. And it was called self-censorship. Now, when he came back to Denmark, he experienced self-censorship in his own newspaper, Jyllands Posten. And um, he said, no, we'll publish it. Now, the difference is, of course, between hurting people's deepest religious feelings and in the Soviet Union having a different political point of view. It's not the same thing. I had lunch with Muslims. They were top clerics from Al-Azhar in Cairo. And um, <clears throat> the top clerics told me, this is not about the cartoons. This is not. We are about the cartoons. We are used to that. And um, we have all this experience that the West has no respect for our feelings. Uh, we could also make some cartoons if we wanted, you know. We can take the whole New Testament and each page can inspire a cartoon if you want to do it. And um, incidentally, they said to me, we happen to know that the Danish cartoonist made a cartoon of Jesus Christ going to heaven. And the cartoonist had the same problem as I had as a young child, being taught Christianity at school. How did he do it? Uh, was it wings or some propelling mechanism or what was it, you know? I mean, it's a young guy who wanted to know the mechanics of things. The editor wrote the cartoonist saying, we're not going to publish it because it will hurt the feelings of our Christian readers. So the Muslim cleric said, aha, Christian readers have feelings, how about we? Now, when the Danish government representatives were told that they knew that story, they knew that the debate was lost. But then the Muslims had another argument. They said, it's not really about the cartoons. It's about the Danish government's refusal to have a dialogue. We want just to sit down, try to explain how we react and listen to your side. Your side is saying it's freedom, freedom of expression. We say it is freedom not to be hurt, humiliated in your deepest feelings. Maybe you could find something, com compromise or something. Expression up to a certain point or something of the type. But it will be refused again, 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 again. We cannot accept that. So what I did as a mediator, Tariq was a little bit silent, if I may say so, but the, anyhow, I'm not silent, I'm not a silent type. So I said at one point that my experience is when you have a trauma of this type, then there are three things you have to do. And I have never in my life as a professor seen people taking a sheet of paper and writing one, two, three, so quickly as these Danes. And from a professorial point of view, to have people writing one, two, three, preparing, you know, it's lovely. <laughs> Point one, a kind of acknowledgement. You don't have to apologize, don't say sorry, and don't ask for forgiveness, that's Christian. Be a little bit careful about that one. But you could say, it was not a very bright thing to do. You distance yourself from what you have done. Point two, you have a right to say why you did it. Maybe freedom of expression. Maybe to fight self-censorship. But you also have a duty to listen to the other side. And when I am trying to run this, I say, you have the freedom to do this, but please limit it to a page. Now, take two hours in a room and write it down. And number three, to have a joint project for the future. So you try to clear the past and you build the future, which is the subtitle of our book. So, what came out of the meeting was actually, I put it very in blunt terms, I say today is Friday, 13th of February 2006. In three days we have a Monday. My recommendation would be that the Danish government sends out invitations to dialogue. And that would be youth with youth, women with women, politicians with politicians, clergy with clergy, whatever you have. Send it out. 
and that the acts of retribution against Danish diplomatic and commercial interests are stopped. Then I have a second recommendation. That you appoint a joint commission and that Denmark invites to an international conference on the borderline between freedom of expression and freedom not to be heard. The Danes took number one and not number two. Friday morning, the invitations went out. Friday afternoon, the bombing, the burning, and all of that was stopped. Hmm. How could it be that quickly? Because it was centrally organized, and what is centrally organized can be centrally stopped. You know? hmm. So it worked very, very well for some time. What happened later is a long and complicated story, but the Danes did not want that conference. I have tried to find out why, and they knew it would have to be international, and they were afraid to imply third parties who might be in difficulties. Uh, the country I'm sitting in, for instance. So um, you have that kind of consideration with third parties. So when you say I'm running around the world, one of the things I try to find is a host for that conference. Hmm. Talk about meeting with the Taliban in Afghanistan and assess this war, the longest war in U.S. history. And uh, while you're at it, if you could comment on President Obama. Better keep it quick in order not to against, against laws of um, offending people. You see, um, I'm just going to make this uh -huh, closer. Uh -huh, a little bit closer. Sorry. You see, um, <clears throat> the problem when you meet Taliban, be that in Afghanistan or outside, is not to make them talk; is to make them stop talking. <laughs> and the reason is simply this: if you ask them honestly to explain to you what they stand for. There's nobody who has asked them that, or at least nobody with a Western face like me. They may be asked by somebody to say something, and then to have their arguments quashed and ridiculed and things of that kind. It's not my line. Briefly speaking, they say four things. Point one, we are Muslims. We do not accept secularization. And his winning hearts and minds is all by secular means. Number two, we are 25,000 very autonomous villages and six to eight nations with separate identities. We are not a unitary state with a capital in Kabul. That's a Western illusion. The answer to that is, of course, a loose federation. And at that point, I remember the first time I heard all of this in 2001, I was asking myself, what does this remind me of? And my answer is Switzerland. 5,000 municipalities, very autonomous, and four nations. Now, point three. We want a um, end, an ending to being invaded an end to the idea that we are a kind of position from which others can run the world. And the way we defend ourselves is by autonomous villages and by exactly being divided. There is no point where you can squeeze Afghanistan and say you've gotten it. You can squeeze Kabul, but it's not Afghanistan. Just start squeezing that one. You may squeeze Kabul, but that's all. That's our strategy. We are not going to give up that one. And point four, we suffer from a wound in the middle, the Judan line. And I myself am always amazed when I'm listening to US politicians on this, that they can manage talking three minutes without mentioning the Judan line. Drawn by a British imperialist, foreign secretary in British India, Duran. 1893, as the border between Afghanistan and British India. Now, it's 1,600 miles long, and it runs through Pashtun territory. 
the biggest minority in the world without the state, 40 million, splits it in two. So when they go from one part to the other, they're not going to a safe heaven in Pakistan. They're walking from one part of their own land to another. It's a kind of State Department myth, this Pakistan, Afghanistan kind of thing. And Amy, I would so much hope that if they had the map in State Department and Pentagon, not of states, but of nations, they would see some of the complexity of the world. And maybe also understand the complexity is far more than they can even understand. And these are terribly important and different. So there you have four points. <clears throat> and um, are they acceptable? I think it's totally acceptable that they want Afghanistan Islamic. It's not acceptable that they terrorize women. But they have changed on that one. And I think other Muslims have told them, you are an insult to Quran. If you don't understand that this is your tribal custom, and it's nothing Quranic in it. And they've gotten around on that one, but they say very strongly, we are not going to be told this by Americans and feminists, and particularly not by American feminists. This we are going to be told by our brothers and sisters in Tunisia, the most progressive country, in Indonesia, in Turkey, in the southern Philippines, where um, I have been many times, I'm often, and Amy, permit me to say this, you see, I'm often uh, invited to Muslim conferences as a peace specialist. And once I ask them, you invite me and I'm very grateful, but you know I'm not a Muslim. No, you're not a Muslim, Professor Galton, but you have one advantage. You can talk five minutes coherently about Islam. Islamic theology without making mistakes. And uh, we just like that, you see. What you say is utter trivialities. There's nothing interesting at all. Not even worth listening to. But there is no mistake in it. And then I say, what do I do in minute number six? And he looked at me and said, you are bright enough to shut up. <laughs> Can you imagine a more beautiful compliment? See? I just mentioned it. Now, Bright people in the West have then asked me, could we have your five minutes talk, please? Okay. A couple of points in that one. We're waiting. <laughs> Mohammed was a practicing politician. He ran a city-state called Medina as a patriarch. Moses was a very poor tourist guide, needing 40 years for a relatively short distance. Jesus was preaching, as you said that I was doing around the world. Uh, Muhammad was doing that too. Jesus was not a politician. Now, that of course generates a feeling among Muslims that the city-state he ran for 10 years has a model character. And uh, that is Wahhabism, Abd al-Wahhab. That the good life is the life as lived at the time of Muhammad, when Muhammad had established the city-state. Did not have oil, didn't have Cadillacs, and there were no bases around. So they were the ones who made 9-11. They were the 15 Saudis on board the planes. Left-wing Wahhabism, right-wing Wahhabism is running Saudi Arabia. The country is split down the middle. So this is important to know. And it's important to know they have a model. They have a utopia they look back to. Some of them, not all. So this is just to mention one point. I mean, if you ask most Americans, you know, who were the people who attack the World Trade Center, they would probably say they were from Iraq and Afghanistan. That 15 of them were Saudis. I have been told that by Washington. I mentioned uh, to you earlier the mediation I did in uh, that when I first met Taliban in um, February 2001. We came up with a solution, somewhat similar to what I have been mentioning now. I was in Peshawar couldn't get into Afghanistan. That happened two years later. And when we were through with that one, a former prime minister came up to me and said, this is the best solution I've seen. 
The only point about it is it may it will not work because the Americans will attack us in October. So I said, why will they attack you? He said, they want military bases for the war with China. And they want an oil pipeline from the Caspian through Afghanistan, Pakistan to the Indian Ocean. Come to my house tonight and I'll show you. So we went into, as I explained to the workshop earlier today, uh, all Afghans seem to have a fascination with caves. So he was a refugee and he had his house close to a hill where he had made a cave. So we went into a cave. And we would call the situation room with floodlights and the map. And he put his finger at the point, this is where they want the base. This was February 2001, seven months before 9-11. I lifted his finger, under that was written Bagram. 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 Then he drew a line where the pipeline would be. Exactly correct. The pipeline came in May 2003. Now, I asked him where he had it from. He smiled and looked at me from the best of sources. <laughs> he went a little bit more into detail. Uh, you're not going to get more out of me, nor are you going to get his name. Um, I think you can trust what I say. That war was prepared long ahead of time, had nothing to do with 9-11. And bin Laden was not organizing it from Afghanistan. That doesn't mean that things didn't happen in Afghanistan, and it happened in caves. And BBC managed to find some videotapes and put it on BBC to show that they were preparing things. Now, you look at the video, it's an unmistakable training of rural guerrillas in storming a house in some countryside. And they were doing what they have admitted all the time. They were preparing their brothers and sisters for fighting in Chechnya and in Kashmir. Now, I must say, if I should prepare handling of Twin Towers and Pentagon, which is not that easy, I don't think I would do it from a cave in Afghanistan. That's not a very propitious point of departure. I would do it from a high school in Hamburg, for instance, or from some pilot schools in the US. Okay. That doesn't mean that bin Laden did not accept it with pleasure. And when he made his famous speech where he said, you are now suffering the humiliation we suffered more than 80 years ago. My wife and I, we were living in our apartment in Manassas half an hour from, from Washington, where we are measuring the temperature of the flames of the dragon, the empire, and the pulse, and things of that kind, and talking with many people, including politicians. And um, I made use of my PhD in mathematics to subtract 80 from 2001, came to 1921, but he had said more than. Now, that must be five or less than five, because if it had been six, he would have said less than 90 years, just about 90 years. 1916, the Sykes-Picot treason of the other world. You fight the Turks and you'll get freedom. <laughs> they got two French colonies, Syria, Lebanon, two English colonies, Israel, uh, Palestine, Iraq. Notice I don't say British because I have not accepted the Indian takeover of Scotland. It's not recognized by me, so I don't say British, I say English, which means London with surroundings. Now, 1917, the Balfour Declaration, a Jewish homeland. 1918, the occupation of Istanbul. Now, this is heavy from a humiliation point of view. Then I went Googling to find out how many US media had picked up that little piece of mathematics. You know the answer, zero. If I should be vicious, and I am vicious at times, I could say Washington, a city of liars, USA, a nation of dupes. Don't let, us, don't let yourself be duped. But in order not to be it, listen to the antagonists, those on the other side, with a spoon of salt. Don't believe in everything, check it. 
take Israel. You said Obama, I have tried to avoid it. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want my view of the elections, I hope both of them will lose. <laughs> if you want to know how you do that, you organize abstention. If you can get the abstention rate above 66, even better 75, you've made it. That would not be quite 99%, but both of them represent the 1%. And I cannot say God bless or Allah bless because I don't believe in them, but something like that, I find the Occupy movement fantastic. It's the blossoming of the USA from the bottom. And they have made the USA talk in terms of 99% and 1%. And the richest of the 0.1% with an average 214 million annual income per year, annual income, they don't any longer talk openly about their success. They talk less. Now, to frame that discourse, to be able to launch an alternative discourse that has reached all of America, is no small achievement. They did it. That doesn't mean there are not other things to do. But they did that one. You mentioned Israel-Palestine. Can you take it to the current conflict in the sheet of paper you've handed everyone on 15 conflicts, constructive, destructive U.S. foreign policies, uh, U.S.-Israel versus Arab Muslim states? What about Israel and Palestine? How do you think this conflict can be resolved? I would like to say Israel, Arab states, Judaism, Islam, or Judeo-Christianity in Islam, because it's not just Israel, Palestine. You have an enormous, but not unproblematic, solidarity with Palestinian Muslims from the other 21 Arab countries and from the other 55 Muslim states. But now be careful. The 22 and the 56 say, who drew those borderlines? You people did. There is one Arab nation, and we want an Arab region. There is one Muslim nation, and we want the Ummah, the community of the believers. And one day we'll get it. You see, Amy, the dilemma for the Muslim, and it's not easy for them to find an answer to it. What am I? Am I a citizen or a Muslim? I have the state as one authority. I have Allah through Islam, through the Rasul, the Prophet, as another authority. But Islam says there is only one God. So I cannot accept the state as an authority. So how can I combine it? Well, it would be a democracy and a state dedicated to Islam. So that's why they call it the Islamic Republic, and so on. The Islamic Emirate. And the Islamic region from Morocco, through the whole Arablandia, yeah, to the west, to the southern Philippines, as I mentioned, 56, 57 countries, if you count India, 1,560 million Muslims. There are more Muslims than Chinese. And to beat the Chinese is not that easy. More Muslims than Chinese. They want one something. Maybe they'll call it the Caliphate. It'll take some time. But I have any bit as much right to have that as Catholics have a right to have the Vatican. It will not be the Caliphate of the old. It'll be something else. We Norwegians are almost amazed by how Muslims that come to our country assimilate social democratic values. Not right wing, but social democrat. Because there is a kind of correspondence between zakat, giving 10% to the poor, and the welfare state. And at that point, I would like to tap another point from my five minute speech. If I should mention, if I should try to concentrate two positive points in Islam, 
We leave out the terrible acts of terrorism and the terrible acts of tribal blood revenge and so on. And we can say much about that, but we leave it aside. Togetherness, it's a weak cultural solidarity. And sharing, sharing with the poor. The reason for Ramadan, for fasting, from sunrise to sunset, is to remind yourself of what it is not to have food, not to have water. Now, you may say they compensate in the evening, okay? I wonder how many Christian seculars or Dalmatian Buddhist pagan dogs <laughs> would like one month not to eat and not to drink from sunrise to sunset. You could do it in northern Norway, but there's only two hours between them. <laughs> And if you go to real northern Norway, the sun never rises, so you have no problem. So they have found Muslims who find a refuge at the northern tip of Norway. But um, there is a strength in this, you see. It's a tremendous strength, and that brings us a little bit back to Breivik. Could we learn something? Could it be that we could say thank you, Islam, for teaching us these lessons? We don't want to convert to Islam. But we can, the idea of solidarity and sharing, we find beautiful. Could you help us? Well, say that, you'll be embraced by 1,560 million Muslims. If you just are willing to say, we could learn something from somebody else, without becoming that somebody else, could be interesting. So I just mention it because we get into a lot of theology the moment we start looking at these things, you know. Togetherness and sharing. We are quite good in the West at picking up the weak points. You may pick up the hijab, and you may say, they are forced to conceal their faces. And I could then say, I know a lot of Western women with face lifting and rouge and lipstick and mascara, and so much of it that you need a scrub and a bucket of water to try to find out what their face looks like. And I'm not quite sure that um, they should talk so loudly about the hijab. I can mention another point about hijab. Very many Muslim women have extremely beautiful colors in the hijab. I once walked up to one, and you can say, this is a dirty old man flirting with young women, and of course it is that too. I went up to a young Muslim woman, Spaniard, no, she was not Spaniard, originally, and complimented her on the color of her hijab. And she said, you're the first one who has said that. Whereupon she kept a certain distance, of course, thinking, what's his next move? Yeah. <laughs> now, I am never do a thing like that. I read books about it, but would never do anything like that. So I'm just telling you, there are hijabs and hijabs. And there is rouge and mascara and facelifting of different kinds. <laughs> You've written this book, The Fall of the U.S. Empire, and then what? Um, U.S. fascism or U.S. blossoming. So what does that mean, and where do you think we're headed? U.S. fascism or U.S. blossoming? Could be both. My formula right now is U.S. fascism from the top and U.S. blossoming from the bottom. There is nothing so genuine, best positive Americans as the Occupy movement. Leaderless, nonviolent, dialogical, horizontal, equitable, enormously innovative in its mobilization. Now, when we look at nonviolent movements, just before I come to US fascism, there are some stages they go through. So the first is consciousness formation. Spreading it to others, and I mentioned 99 versus 1%. as a brilliant formula. And like all good Americans, they operate like public relations firms, so you have to find a one-liner, a one that you can put into an ad and put some color on it and things of that kind. So they're good Americans also in that sense. It works. Point two, organization. To be leaderless is brilliant. They should be. Otherwise, we know who would try to capture the leaders. 
It's exactly the same as the 300 mothers at Plaza de Mayo in Buenos Aires did. They had no leader. So when the Norwegian Nobel Peace Prize Committee should hand out the Peace Prize, they couldn't find any mother to give it to, so they gave it to a man instead. Shame on them. Uh, they also said that we cannot pay a ticket for 300 mothers to come to Norway for the ceremony. There are, there, are more, there are more creative ways of solving that. Putting a photo of them on the chair, for instance. Now, having said that, point three, a confrontation. Well selected. Amy, I pay attention to... What a shame. I haven't seen President Obama come out a single time sitting down with them dialoguing. With? President Obama. I haven't seen it. Sitting down with? With the occupiers. I haven't seen him doing what Bob McNamara did and writes about in the book in retrospect, very touchingly. That, you know, the students came, the anti-Vietnam War movement, outside his office, he was a workaholic. So they knew that the only window where there was light at 10 o'clock in the evening would be Bob. So they were down there and they were making their speeches and things of that kind. And then he decided to get out to talk some sense into them. You should read those pages. They talked sense into him. It's very touching. Now, why didn't he do something the day after? It's not that easy when you have that position. Give him some time. He did it. He was hated by Washington. You can say he took a risk by meeting them. Obama doesn't take that risk. He's a coward. So the confrontation would be for 10,000 occupiers to circle the White House and just say, Mr. President, come out. Just want to have a dialogue. Then comes the positive aspect, and that's when you struggle by doing things. They haven't come to that stage yet. So um, when I'm talking with them, they say, interesting. <laughs> but Johan, we are not going to take your ideas. We're going to develop them ourselves. And uh, with this bit of good luck, I'll find some version of something I've said. But you see, it's not a question now of copyright or things of that type. A question of stimulating. But I would think in terms of agricultural cooperatives with sales points, growing food in an organic way, a green way, all over the US, invigorating the countryside, cooperative, less vulnerable to the ups and downs, selling food that is healthy at much lower prices. There would be sufficient amount of forces fighting them. If you do it many times, 10,000 of those, and you have made it. I would argue in favor of local savings banks, or boycotting the hedge funds. Girl cutting, as they say, the small savings banks. And they would even say that maybe you could learn from the Muslims, from the Sharia, where the law is never lend out more than 30% of your capital. Uh, the U.S. limit was 2,400, <clears throat> that Bush found too limiting. After that, the sky has been the limit. And when you come tumbling down from the sky, you tumble quite deep at accelerating speed. And the third idea is an idea that I have as a um, professor, as an older professor. You want to beat the tuition fees? Mobilize retired professors to teach the courses for almost nothing. They can draw on their spare pension funds. Get rid of the administrators by administering it together with the students. Make 1,000 of them and you have one. For the retired professors, it would be a blessing because retired means to be tired again and again and again. That's why it's called retired, you see. So, as you may guess from me, <clears throat> I am not retired and I'm not tired. <laughs> so to my colleagues in the room, for heaven's sake, don't retire. <laughs> but offer those courses. It will be a blessing to the retired professors. What do we have that freshly minted PhDs don't have? Okay, young PhD, prepare yourself. 
First of all, we have experience. Second, we have the higher level of knowledge called wisdom. It comes with white hair. I see in the room some, of pe some people qualify. Thank you. Others are on the way. Thank you. Thank you. So you see, that I, there's hope for the future. Well, maybe we can hear from some people in the room and open up this discussion. By the way, as we're doing this, I know that uh, we were passing around some Democracy Now! daily digest sign-up sheets. Have you been signing up? Uh, have you seen them by chance, passing through the audience? I hope you all sign up before um, it's... Uh, so one word of the US fascism would be a New York Police Department spying on them, as has been well documented. Say that again. You have the top spying on them. You have Guantanamo going on. You have the Patriot Act going on. You have extrajudicial killing in other countries. Doing it on the sly in a sneaky way so there is even less opportunity to discuss it in Congress. You have Petreo shuttle, shuttle from the Pentagon to CIA the secretization of the war, the Blanco through the um, Authorization Act on New Year's Eve to do almost anything, the abolition of habeas corpus, these are pure fascist things. Hmm. It's very serious, extremely serious, and the options that the US public is offered for the 6th of November is not very appetizing. Now, somebody has said that if we could get a third party, we would at least have a two-party system. <laughs> so, that would help a lot. <laughs> now, <laughs> I don't know how that would come. The history of the third party movement in the US is not very inspiring. Would someone like to ask a question, make a comment? Yes. And if you'd like to, these are the Daily Digest sign-up sheets, by the way. Um, do you have one yes. of them there? Oh, okay, so they're going to be passing them on. Thank you. Um, sorry. <laughs> is this? Uh, what is your name? Is that good? My name is John Schwarzenbach. Stand up. My name is John Schwarzenbach, and I'm active with Occupy, with the Direct Action and the Food Committee, and also with uh, Occupy Vacant Lots. So my question would be, could you explain to us or talk about how the Norwegian people separated themselves from the 1% in 1910 or so, approximately? How which people? How the, the Norwegian people separated themselves from the 1% in 19... I think it was 1910. 10? In 19... I'm not sure of the year. Uh, He's not sure of the year. 1910? Perhaps in 1920. 1910, 1920, how the Norwegian people separated themselves from the Through non-violent acts. Ha, 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 ha. Okay. You see, it's an extremely important question. And 1%, 99% or, um, was the situation. We were not an industrial country, but we were, of course, inspired by the working class party, the Norwegian Labour Party. But the Norwegian Labour Party knew extremely well that they would never be able to win an election. And the only way they could win it would be to enter an alliance with surf, small farmers and fishermen. They tended to be quite conservative politically. And where the Norwegian Labour Party was partly Marxist and partly atheist, they were very Christian. The formula was to forge an alliance between them that came in 1935. Oh, small people. And the condition of the alliance was the following. The fishermen, the small farmers, they said, we'll cooperate with you, we'll even vote for you, but there's one condition. You have a way of struggling called a strike. And whatever you win will also come to us. They came up with a problem very quickly. The workers were struggling for a three-week paid vacation. 
The farmers wanted immediately a three weeks paid vacation. They had a problem, milking the cows. The cows were not in the deal, you see? And it was not the industrial workers' problem. And you see, it's almost unbelievable. But here you have a genuine dilemma. And you can now ransack your mind what's the solution to that one. I'll just tell you immediately. Uh, farmer substitutes who go from farm to farm and milk the cows. And that's what happened, so that they could take an ever so small vacation, but would be camping in some other part of Norway, modest at that time. But the alliance was forged on that one. Now, the second point was, of course, you are going to get higher salaries, wages. We also want more money. They got more money through cooperatives. Instead of competing with each other, they sold the fish to a cooperative that fetched higher prices. Now, these were formulas that lasted for some time. Then the weaknesses of those formulas came up. But we're not going to get into that. Your question is a very precise and good one, and this is exactly how it happened. Johan, we have another yeah. The cows almost destroyed the whole thing. Why don't, why don't you stand up? Okay, this message is, I mean, I'm sorry, this uh, question's for you, Dr. Galton, of course. Um, you mentioned education, and on April 25th, uh, the Occupy movement will be recognizing the $1 trillion debt for students throughout the country, superseding the credit card debt. I would like to ask you for a call to action. Will you come and teach, either in New York or in Philadelphia, and ask your professors who are retired to come and teach with you, either by email or phone, so that we can learn from you. <laughs> April 25 is in two days. <laughs> and I have a workshop for Diane on that day. And in the afternoon, I have one hour with Al Jazeera. So I could ask them to switch on Al Jazeera, and maybe I can use Al Jazeera for that purpose. <laughs> but the thing is beautiful, and you can count on me for coming, if not exactly that day. I'd just like to make one point, you see. There is another way of running the economy, and you know it perfectly well. I'll just remind you of it. Instead of exchanging by means of money, you use one human hour as the unit. And my story about it is, um, just as an example, being asked to um, give talks in the part of Spain where I live, which I love, on mediation. And the guy in the high school saying, you see, this is not on the curriculum that Madrid forces upon us, so we cannot pay you anything. And I said, I have so much love for this, I'll be, do it with pleasure. Now, this love story came around, and there were demands from all the high schools in the environment. And uh, my love come to, uh, you know, there's a limit even to love. So then, you know, I mentioned to them that if I could exchange one hour lecturing from one hour cleaning my house, it might be interesting. And I'm not going to say that my hour is worth more than the cleaning lady's hour. I'm going to say one hour is one hour. And how do I know that? It's in the Human Rights De Declaration, where it says everybody. Now, if you multiply a good life expectancy with the number of hours, we are millionaires, you see. So the point is, you could have more exchanges on an hour basis than on a dollar basis and you would beat the system. You could still have a book where you have a credit. You have offered so and so many hours of what we call voluntary service, and somebody should do something in return. I can then go into all kinds of details, but you see, we have to think economics new. We have to do that. Uh, be aware that you could run up a debt on that one too. You could do it. And there would be some guy keeping a book. <laughs> I think uh, you owe 48 hours volunteer work now. And forget about the word volunteer. So 
So I'm not blind to that aspect, but I just mention it. There's someone else back there. We're near the field of education. Sue Cannon, I asked you about this earlier. I want to ask you more specifically, what should we be doing to help our students in schools learn about negotiation, mediation, seeing themselves as human citizens, citizens of the world, members of the human family? What are some of the specifics we should be doing as teachers in schools and as families at home? Yeah. We are um, doing that in a couple of schools in Norway and through the European Union. We are doing it in some schools in Spain and some schools in Ireland. And it's called Sabona. And Sabona is a Sulu word which means I see you, I take you in. And the first word we drop is the word negotiation. I would prefer the word mediation. You see, negotiation is a kind of um, continuation of war by verbal means. You try to win the debate and to get the best possible deal. The point about mediation is to find out what all parties want, identify the legitimate things they want, and then try to create a new reality where that can be satisfied. So we call that the transcend method. Transcend means go beyond the new reality. And um, when I was mediating in 1995 between Ecuador and Peru, about 500 square kilometers in the Andes, and they had been fighting 54 years about where to draw the border, my recommendation was to run the zone together. Zona binacional, parque natural, a binational or bistatal zone with a natural park. Three years later, that was the peace treaty. And the longest war in Latin American history was ended. You see, the point is that when you make a compromise, you leave both sides a little bit satisfied and quite unsatisfied. Because both sides wanted access to the whole territory. Now, they wanted only for themselves. But it was easier for them to swallow the idea that the other nation would also be that than to get only half. So it's the creativity of finding that beyond which I would like to stimulate in children. We find in these schools in Norway that children around 10, 12 pick it up immediately immediately and they go hunting for such solutions and they become very good at it and we call it solution type five solution type one or two is either you or you type three is neither nor type four is compromise type five is both and and they call themselves fiver detectives and you know what they say when they have become 12, 13, they say it's considerably more f fascinating than finding x and y in 2x plus 3y equals zeros and 4x minus 7y equals 15, which corresponds to absolutely nothing. I'm a mathematician. It is pure bullshit. Absolutely nothing corresponds to nothing. They will solve their last set of two equations with two unknowns at the examination table. We'll never use it again in their lives. I find it a perpetration. I would even say it's a kind of, yeah, it's a kind of crime. I could say, Nuremberg, where are you when you permit this to happen again and again and again? And there is so much fascinating math in the world that could be better. So, I'm optimistic about it, and we find that in the school where we are operating, bullying goes down to zero. They simply ask both parties or three parties, and it's usually physical when boys are involved, and it is snide remarks behind the backs when girls are involved. 
Uh, don't think of bullying as a male specialty. The methods are a little bit different. And of course, both sides can say something about that. What you try to do is you then find that the other in the class get at them and try to say what you want and can't we find a solution and something you can cooperate on. We have even had, you see, small boys and small girls, 10 years old, 8 years old, when their parents quarrel, say, Mom, Dad, I think I see a solution. <laughs> well, that's quite something. And the teachers who are teaching this, some of them have told me that you don't know how much it has renovated our marriage just to practice these rules. <laughs> so I just mention it. And I have mentioned that equity and harmony are extremely important. And you can convey that with examples. And you can also convey reconciliation and resolution with examples. And there you have already the components of peace. Is this working? Yeah? Uh, so I'd, I'd like to ask a question of both Amy and Professor Goltung, if, if possible. Uh, this is about the role of stories. The role of? The role of stories, of capturing the stories. The role of stories. Stories. Well, the, the, and, and the role of sharing stories in building peace and in making social change. And I'm wondering if, Amy, if you'd be willing to start as someone who, who does a lot of story gathering and also music playing, the, the role of music as well in, mm -hmm. in social movements. Um, you know, I think journalists are first and foremost storytellers either telling stories or providing a forum for people to speak for themselves, or telling people stories until they can tell their own. But I was just struck um, when asking Johan about where he is headed next. He's going to Washington and then to Guernica um, in Spain. Uh, this is a little story. Uh, 75 years ago, uh, the Germans bombed Guernica, and this is the anniversary of that bombing under Franco. And Pablo Picasso um, was so enraged by what happened to the Spanish town. He was outside of Paris and in a 21-day frenzy, he painted that famous painting, the Guernica, which became an anti-war symbol all over the world because it showed the agony of war etched in the faces of the animals and the people. Um, he said that that painting could never go to Spain under Franco. And so he had weavers make three tapestry reproductions of that painting so that they could travel the world so the painting wouldn't be destroyed. And one of those tapestries of Guernica has hung outside the UN Security Council for decades in New York at the United Nations. And in the lead up to the invasion of Iraq, it wasn't lost on the UN and US officials that here they had their microphone and their uh, podium for press conferences where they were making these pro-war statements in front of this anti-war backdrop. You know, people like Colin Powell, who was then Secretary of State, and others. And so they shrouded the Guernica with a blue curtain. Under the pretext that it was under repair. It was a total lie. So it is our job to pull that curtain back. Mm. I think as journalists, as citizens, not only of the United States, but of the world, to show the realities of war. And I think that's what Johann Galtung does as he travels the world. He not only shows us the reality of what's on the ground, but of what can be, of what is possible. And it's not the angst of war, it's something different, that peace is possible. And that's why I'm so grateful for what you do. <laughs> Thank you, Amy. Thank you. You say it's very kind of you to put it that way. Thank you. And when you travel around the world, pick up the best all places. I have a book called Globalizing God. And it's no particular God, I try to pick the best. So from Islam, I pick sharing, I pick togetherness, 
and Islam means peace. And from Christianity, I pick from the Orthodox branch, optimism. From the Catholic branch, if the sinner makes distance to his sin, we can reintegrate him, restore him, restorative justice. And from um, Protestantism, I take the idea of the individual consciousness. Here I am, I cannot do otherwise, as Luther said. Now I mentioned six points. From Judaism, I take dialogue. I don't take chosen people, promised land. I don't think that was the most brilliant idea. <laughs> I take dialogue. <clears throat> you have seven ideas. Now if you combine those, you are not badly equipped for living in this world. You have to respect all of them. And you can, of course, move them into Buddhism, pick up everything hangs together, nonviolence. And to Hinduism, the trinity of creation, preservation and destruction. And from Taoism, the yin yanginess of everything. And from Confucianism, the idea of harmony. So, See, you just get into these and you try to pick them up and you add humanism, human rights, basic needs. And you add American Psychological Association section number 40, to, 48, 48, precisely, to all of these. <laughs> you see, we have so much richness in this world and that also goes for the economy. You run around the world, hmm, I like that one, I like this one, I like this one. And um, so in the book I'm now working like mad on called Peace Economics, uh, the epilogue, I think, is going to be called Neither Capitalism Nor Socialism, colon, Eclecticism. Called what? Eclecticism. Try to find the best that you can. Pick a cooperative movement, you know. Take the idea from, so important in India, Indian culture, of having the older people share their wisdom with the younger. So take them out of the ghetto called retirement, where the best thing you can offer them is a golf course or something like that, to have them teach real courses, not golf courses. <laughs> and uh, you, you do it that way, you see. And, uh, uh, well, the inspiration. I could add to it, to be married to a Japanese is a fantastic inspiration. So, if you have plans of marrying, look outside your own country. <laughs> I can guarantee you that you will have an interesting life. It won't be without problems, but it will be fascinating. And you'll grow with it. I wonder whether there are one or two more questions before we shift into the book signing in the other room. Question over here. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I was wondering, uh, I've noticed this trend for a long time. When there's an outbreak of violence or terrorism, wherever it is or whatever spin is put on it, we often hear of rapid deployment military teams who go in to meet violence with violence. And that seems to be the first thing we're, we're given. Uh, once an incident occurs, it's very hard to put the genie back in the bottle. And the truth is often lost in the shuffle. Sometimes it takes years for the truth to finally come out. And I was wondering why we can't have a rapid deployment peace force that could go mm -hmm. to areas where incidents happen and try to root out the truth before we turn it into another war or another disaster. I very much like the way you formulated it. Of course we can have that. But be aware of the fact that to solve and to identify and solve a conflict is not so easy. However, it doesn't take that much time. You go into an area, you start with those who obviously are parties to the conflict, and you ask them with whom else shall I talk? And if you do that again and again and again, and I'll give you just some small hints about how to do it, suddenly you know more than anybody else about the situation. 
for heaven's sake, don't read a book about that area before. You become a slave of that author. Try to let the party speak to you. And try to understand that there is no one truth. There are truths in plural. The way we go about it, the Transcend Method, is that the first question is, what is the Afghanistan you would like to live in? Future constructive. Then we go to past, present, destructive. What's happening? Now, they're usually much better at point two than point one. People are not good at talking about future, and they're not good at talking about constructive. But you can help them. When you ask them what's happening, they will go on endlessly, and they'll tell you how bad the other side is. So it will be relatively black-white. With women being better at the yin-yang aspect. Then the third point, was there a period in the past that was good? And the Afghan will tell you about the golden age. It was a certain period, roughly speaking, from the, let us say, yeah, I would put it that way, from the end of the Second World War to the communist takeover. And the fourth question is, what are you most afraid of for the future? So future destructive. Now do that, and you know an enormous amount. The first time I did it was in 1967 for the Council of Europe. I was asked to explore possibilities of peace in Europe. And fortunately, they didn't have any money. Because if they had had money, we would probably have had a public opinion survey, which is not a good method. You see, the dialogue with back and forth and so on is much better. So. I had access to only one person in 19 countries, in each country. The question is, which person? So we agreed that foreign ministers come and go, prime ministers come and go, the head of the political department of the foreign office. There was a young man in the uh, United States of America and Washington called Brzezinski. He is about my age. and. Um, uh, he had no idea about me, but I asked him very constructive questions. He had extremely constructive ideas, come through much more charmingly than he otherwise usually does. And the young man on the other side in Moscow was Yuri Valentsov, known for the walks in the woods around Geneva, the chief negotiator there. And suddenly I was sitting there, 19 countries, 25 questions for each, and I knew more than anybody else. Nobody else had done it. And suddenly I looked at the matrix, and you know, I mean, being an intellectual, you would imagine that I had 25 questions there and 19 countries there, looking at it. They were all like the UN, UN Economic Commission for Europe. And they all said that our biggest problem is security. So I said, how about the UN Security Commission for Europe? Uh, that was called brilliant and prophetic. Not at all, I was just reading my matrix. It became the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. It started the day I read that matrix. And Brzezinski, without knowing it, contributed to it. Now, you can train people in that. Send 100 of them into Syria. Let them have 100 dialogues blossom. Much better than monitoring ceasefire, which I won't be able to do anyhow, because, you know, when you're hiding a needle in a haystack, you have to be a haystack specialist to find it. <laughs> and these people come from the outside. And there is no such thing as ceasefire. They're only redeploying and smuggling in new arms because they have no solution. You have to have a solution, a compelling solution on the wall. And the suggestion you have the Rapid Deployment Peace Force could do that, but they would have to know how to do it. So I have given you one image. I'm not at all insisting this is the only one. I'm just saying that's my experience. Is, this will be the last question for this part of the evening. The problem is not a question. The problem is the answer, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. uh, hi, my name is Griffin Boyce, and 
Uh, my name is Griffin Boyce, and um, I just had a question for both of the panelists today. Um, is there anything you would recommend for someone who is seeking a, a richness of experience in life? I didn't get it. Can you answer it? Is there something you would recommend for someone seeking a richness of experience in life? <laughs> Take up challenges. The challenge is the best gift you can ever get. And don't let it pass by. Take it. And there may be nobody asking you to do it, but you will grow with it. So a challenge is a problem with no solution, a conflict with no solution. Take it up, let it grow inside you. So for that reason, that's the way you become creative, you see. The creativity will blossom, and that, that's a gift you can give to others. You see, we pagans with Buddhist spots, we are also concerned with the life after death, but we have another answer. And um, I was once in a Buddhist monastery uh, to get some more insight. And the Buddhist monk told me, well, Buddhism teaches you that there is no God, no Satan, no paradise, no hell, no individual soul. Which sounds a little bit sort of uh, non-religious. That's where the pagan part of the dog comes in. And uh, no soul. And it teaches you rebirth. So I said, look, if I have no soul, how can I be reborn? And uh, he said, yes, all Buddhists have that problem. Now, Professor Galtung, I give you 20 years, you think of that problem and come back to me in 20 years. The two answers I'm not going to accept. Answer number one, I have no soul and there will be no rebirth. That's called atheism, secularism, that's not Buddhism. There's an other answer I will not accept. I have a soul. It will be reborn once, up there or down there, depends on my behavior and the Creator's judgment on my behavior. Am I finishing in black ink or red ink? Red for hell's fire. Or the Hindu answer that I have reincarnation again, 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 again. That we not accept, that's Hinduism. So come back in 20 years. I did come back in 20 years. <laughs> and I don't think my answer was very original, but I said, um, I live on. In the sparks of inspiration I can give to other people. Just like I have been inspired and is riding on the waves of inspiration by other people. One of them being Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, obviously. And we are all riding on those waves, and you see in Buddhism, that network of those waves, that's the reality, and you are just a little point in it. Well, I happen to share that. And um, creativity makes you able to contribute more. So take challenges. They may look hopeless. The more hopeless they look, the more interesting. You might like to consult with somebody else because there might be too much for one person. So I'm sharing that with greetings from um, pagan Buddhist dog. <laughs> and following up on what Johan just said, you might want to join with someone else because the challenge might be too great. I think that really is a key part of the success of Occupy. However, it is, uh, it expresses itself this spring. It was the actual community, not just a virtual community. You know, it's interesting, um, my colleague, Sharif Abdel Kadus, who broadcast from Tahrir for those 18 days, how many of you heard Democracy Now!'s coverage? If you didn't, you can watch it online at democracynow.org. It was truly amazing. Uh, Sharif is an incredibly brave Egyptian-American journalist who went home to cover this. It shocked him as well, because he had grown up in a dictatorship and did not think it could be overthrown. He was the grandson of uh, the greatest writer of Egypt, Ahsen Abdel Kudus, um, and his great-grandmother was Rosal Youssef, a great writer. So he comes from a very illustrious family, but uh, could never 
actually believe that there would be any kind of freedom there. And then he lands in Tahrir. He said Mubarak's first mistake was turning off the internet. Because he said, after all, we are Egyptian. Uh, we would have been home on Facebook and on the internet finding out what's going on. And when he turned off the internet, we had to go outside and see for ourselves. <laughs> and it was that power that people often can't express. And you feel it in encampments. You uh, saw it in Tahrir. People felt it there. Is that they felt a kind of freedom in real community. So you go from the digital age of this century, but coming back to that real warmth and possibility of what it means to recreate a constructive community. So I think that is the greatest hope of how we live together. Um, how Democracy Now! fits into that is it brings out the voices of people all over in community who are struggling to make the world a better place. And that's why I think that Independent media, in radio, television, on the internet, is so important because it's not beholden to these entities that break community, that put obstacles in the way, hurt community. Um, and so I want to encourage everyone to tune in. And uh, as we wrap up and as Johan goes out to sign books, tomorrow on Democracy Now!, um, we may be speaking with Danny Glover. I talked to him early today. He's going to try to get down to Washington tomorrow because it's Mumia Abu-Jamal's 58th birthday tomorrow. Um, Mumia Abu-Jamal, who was on death row, of course, for so long right here in this state. You know, the reason that Democracy Now! Um, was taken off of Temple Radio uh, was because we dared to air the voice of Mumia Abu-Jamal. We were completely shocked by this years ago. We were the most popular program on that station. Their program guides that were using Democracy Now! as a model, they had just sent it out to their listeners. And then we started to air a series of commentaries of Mumia Abu-Jamal. And we were shut down, and they started to play music on the station, saying that people were requesting more music. The problem was their program guide had gone out saying people were uh, very excited about how successful Democracy Now! was. Um, but it is not about whether you agree with the voice or disagree with the voice, mm -hmm. and I think Johan Galtung is the embodiment of this. It's about how important it is to hear people's voices on both sides of the bars, on the death rows of this country, and those of us who are on the other side, um, who sometimes feel free and at other times feel imprisoned in other ways. Uh, that's our job in the media. And the reason it's so important is we have enormous decisions to make, whether we like it or not in this country. We come from the most powerful country on earth. What your country does and the rest of the world has a tremendous impact. And so we have to take responsibility for this, whether we agree with what our country does or what it doesn't. And we have to start with a dialogue. And I think that starts with an open and honest media. So I hope you take many of these, well, yours are a little shorter, but flyers. I hope you tune into Mind TV, channel 35.1, and other channels every day at 6, and other radio stations. But pass them out to your friends, family, leave them in laundromats and coffee shops, and let people know there is a media that builds community, doesn't break it down. You know, not the know-nothing pundits who know so little about so much. <laughs> So thank you all for coming out. It's been such an honor to be here and such an honor to see Johan Galtung again. Thank you so much, Amy. My pleasure. Thank you. So a big thank you to Amy, to Johan. I feel like we just got started with a conversation here, and so we'll see this as the first, perhaps, of many, and intend to bring these, these two back soon. Thank you all for being part of the conversation.